After it is designed, but before it can be occupied, a building must be constructed. This is the story of the construction of Milstein Hall at Cornell University. The green or vegetated roof of Milstein Hall starts out pretty much like any protected membrane roof. First, a corrugated metal deck is placed over the steel structural beams and concrete is cast into this decking to create a flat surface. Because the roof must slope to drains, the deck is first coated with a three-component water-based epoxy-modified Portland cement bonding agent, or primer. And then, a special two-component polymer-modified cementitious mortar is mixed on the roof itself and poured over this primer. A 2 by 4 screed is used to flatten the surface so it conforms to the necessary slopes, which are pretty subtle, but which will direct any water to roof drains. Once the surface cures sufficiently, rolls of roofing material are lifted up to the roof level. Meanwhile, the edges of the roof are built up with metal studs and covered with exterior sheathing boards, just as they are on the exterior face. Temporary metal guardrails, no longer needed, are cut and ground down so that the roofing membrane can be applied. Before the waterproofing membrane is installed, a self-adhered solvent-based primer is applied to the topping slab. A torch is used to dry off the concrete surface before the primer is applied, although I'm not sure that this is the recommended method for making sure the flame is hot enough. Is he really sticking his hand in there? Hmm. The roofing membrane is an orange-colored, self-adhering, heat-weldable thermoplastic PVC with an integral fiberglass matte carrier sheet for dimensional stability, containing pigments, stabilizers, and biocide. It is rolled out so that it overlaps the adjacent sheet. Let's listen as the field foreman explains how the system works. Sarnafil? Sarnafil, yeah. 741. 476. 476, okay. 476. And it's adhered with some sort of... A primer. Primer, okay. Yeah. And then... And and Self-adhered backing to the membrane. Great. And then next layer is some sort of protection membrane? Yeah, or an HP protection. Mat, then three layers of extruded insulation, then a drainage panel, then the overburden, and then the plants. So, okay, and this is gonna all happen in the next month or two? Within the next month. Let's review the essential elements of a green roof from bottom to top. First is the structural substrate. In this case, a concrete deck with a topping slab. Next is the waterproof roof membrane. On top of that is some sort of protection barrier, and then rigid insulation, here extruded polystyrene or XPS, that can be exposed to water. After that, a drainage layer to capture and direct water to the roof drains or gutters. And finally, the growing medium, and then the plantings. In this case, two types of sedums. The key to making this membrane waterproof is to seam or weld together all the joints. This is done in various ways. For long runs, an automatic robot welder is used. For the smaller detail areas where seams or flashings need to be welded, a handheld heat gun is used. While the orange horizontal roof membrane is being applied, a white PVC flashing membrane, formulated for application on vertical surfaces, is rolled out in preparation for its application on the concrete skylight walls. Specially prefabricated corner pieces are heat welded into place where the skylight walls intersect the orange membrane, providing a continuous waterproof seal. Other circular pieces provide added protection where roof membrane seams intersect the vertical flashing. To complete the roofing membrane, once the horizontal roof surface and skylights are covered, the building edges must be finished or flashed. As mentioned earlier, the metal stud fascia that supports stone veneer panels is covered with exterior gypsum sheathing on both the outside and inside surfaces. Then, bent sheet metal strips are fastened under the roofing and up onto the ver vertical sheathing. The roofing is then adhered to this surface, completely covering what now appears as a low parapet wall. Finally, the roof membrane is screwed through a metal edge strip on the exterior face of the wall. Where Milstein intersects the existing buildings on its southern and eastern edges, the roofing is formed into gutters at Sibley Hall and flashed into the existing walls of both Sibley and Rand Halls. 
Aside from edge gutters, the roof also slopes into internal roof drains. Beneath the eventual green roof plantings, the concrete topping slopes in the direction shown by these arrows to a lowered area with a pair of drains. Here we can see the drains in the actual roof. One is the regular roof drain and the other with a raised flange to prevent water from draining into it under ordinary circumstances is the emergency or backup drain. Before the edge of the roof is finished, we can see all the layers that comprise the green roof. In particular, the three layers of extruded polystyrene rigid insulation that are placed above a protection layer over the roof membrane. When the snow falls, it's easy to see why the cast concrete skylight walls covered with white membrane flashing will also need to be insulated. The ring of melted snow around each unfinished skylight demonstrates the effect of heat loss through the as yet uninsulated concrete walls. With the roofing and flashing in place, the skylights can now be finished. This view shows the glass in place, but with no insulation and no seals at the glass edges. After the glass is in place, rigid insulation is adhered to the outside of the white membrane flashing, and metal plates are installed that create a seal at the glass edges. Finally, aluminum cladding is attached around the insulation. The joints will all eventually be sealed. From the inside, the concrete walls of the skylight remain visible under the sloped glazing. Returning to the various layers that make up the green roof, we see a drainage mat placed above the insulation so that the insulation does not get saturated with water. The drainage mat directs water to roof drains and gutters. It is protected with some filter fabric so that it remains free of soil. And then the soil or growing medium, actually more like the consistency of gravel, is placed above. This growing medium is lifted up to the roof and then spread around with wheelbarrows. Because stone veneer and coping are not yet in place, the green roof is temporarily held back from the roof edges. The last element of the green roof is, well, the green stuff, viewed here through the third floor windows of Sibley Hall. As is often the case with extensive green roofs, those with just a few inches of growing medium, sedums are the plants of choice, since they seem to do well in this relatively unsympathetic terrain. Milstein's sedums were grown and supplied by Mother Plants, a woman-owned nursery just 10 miles east of Milstein Hall. <laughs> Plants are brought to the site and inserted into the growing medium one at a time, with care taken to establish the pattern drawn by the architects, using two different sedums, each with its own color. With over 20,000 square feet of green roof area, and assuming that each plant occupies, well, about one square foot, one can imagine the effort required to insert each of these 20,000 individual sedum plants carefully by hand making sure that the colored patterns are accurately implemented. The rationale given for this complex pattern of sedum colors can perhaps only really be understood by people who have spent too much time in academic settings. Quoting from Cornell's Milstein Hall website, we discover that, quote, the sedum dots gradually increase in diameter as they approach the gorge, creating a landscape that is orderly and structured nearest the arts quad, and a denser, less structured field as it reaches the gorge. End quote. Ultimately, not so long after the pretty photos have been taken, these colored sedums will grow where they want to grow, and the rigorous pattern is likely to give way to something more unpredictable. At the edge of the roof gutter, the green roof layers are held back by a perforated screen. And because the roof is inaccessible, this view over the foundry building across the street and toward Cayuga Lake in the distance will unfortunately never be available to students, staff, or faculty. Yeah.